Oh, hey, Internet. I'm Steve. Welcome to Wrap Up. So Brandon's a big fat liar. I'm not a dirt, dirty rotten liar. Yes, you are. Or else we're all in trouble. The connections and significance of the secret projects to the Cosmere apparently increase as we move through them. With Secret Project 2 not even being in the Cosmere, I figured with the first one, I'd have a nice relaxing time reading a fluffy romantical adventure with occasional nods or allusions to wider things. False. But before we get into that, I just have to gush about this blasted book. Tress of the Emerald Sea is immediately one of my favorite reads in the Cosmere. This may be my go-to recommendation for newbies now. It was fun, it was exciting, it was hilarious, the magic system was engaging, the characters were understandable, and who can resist Hoyd telling a pirate story? Pirates is good. If you have not read it yet, I cannot speak higher of this book even if you have. Similar in tone to its inspiration material, which is one of my favorite movies anyway, it absolutely nails that almost fairy tale vibe while still being firmly entrenched in everything we've come to expect with Sanderson's writing. I do have to say, I was enormously impressed with the quality of the prose in this book. It may have been simply a result of Hoyd's voice influencing how the story was told, but I didn't feel like there were any exposition dumps or strictly explanatory passages that pop up particularly in Sanderson's earlier work in the entire thing. It wasn't just a good read, it was a delightful, pleasurable read. There were sentences that felt yummy in my brain. Also, can we talk about the art? Howard Lyon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll show more as we get through the spoilery bits in this video, but I mean, come on! I've also been to Howard's studio before. He's incredibly nice and has a truly amazing beard. Also magic. All right, Brandon lied, or at least under-exaggerated the amount of connections this story would have to the Cosmere at large. It is one of the less Cosmere relevant. This is a backwater. This is not considered really important. Not important? Not important? The Aethers are very relevant, but these are an offshoot of the Aethers. Okay, let's talk about the Aethers. There are 12 moons on Lumar, positioned like the points on a 12-sided die, and each of these moons is spewing forth a different type of Aether aether spore. Little bits of magical dust that explode in really weird ways if they get wet, pulling investiture directly out of the spiritual realm to do so. Now these are not the usual way aethers present themselves in the Cosmere. We'll talk more about aether bound and primal aethers in another video. These ones are more aggressive and less sentient, though they all function via the Luhel bond. New kind of bond just dropped, which exchanges physical matter, in this case water, for control over the associated bonded substance. Sounds kind of like sand mastery. There are six types of spores talked about in Tress of the Emerald Sea. Verdant, the emerald type, which explodes in fast-growing vine tendrils. Zephyr, a blue spore, which releases large amounts of air. Rosite, pink aether, which forms crystal structures. These three seas are the only safely inhabited ones, apparently. Crimson spores get all spiky, sunlight spores release light and heat, and midnight spores, which can make gloopy monster boys if they like you. There's also mention of bone spores, but nothing really solid about them. I think my grandpa has those. These spores pull investiture directly from the spiritual realm and convert it into matter, which certainly can be an explosive process. They can also be shaped or influenced by the intents or commands of users. Yes, those are capitalized. Or repelled with steel and attracted with iron. Those aren't the only metals that do stuff, though. There might be up to 14 others. Silver is able to kill spores in proximity or sever any errant bonds with midnight essence. And of course, aluminum shields everything from everything else. So already we've got at least a base understanding for half of a brand new magic system. We've seen hints of its existence in other places, and in a recent book we finally meet a user, as well as its potential interactions with a separate magic system. Yes, you're very smart. Shut up. All right, fine. Let's get into the story. Spoilers for Tress and like everything else. Chapter one. Hoyd's telling this story, and there are hints throughout as to who he's telling it to. 
with mentions of Linji, who tried to sail around the world with no AVR, the speaking minds inhabiting the ships you've seen landing on your planet, and consistent references to nautical familiarity. Move the thing! I'm pretty sure he's speaking to someone on First of the Sun in the far future of the Cosmere. Given that timetable, I've got a very specific and concerning question for our Worldbringer friend. Where's design? Having read the preview chapters for the other secret projects, I suspect we might get an answer on that, but still. The first few chapters focus mostly on world building. Tress was raised on a small island in the Emerald Sea. Our favorite pastimes were collecting cups and talking with the Charlie that worked there. His name was the Duke's son. But she never called him that. Isn't that a wonderful beginning? Yeah, it's really good. It was interesting to note the minor changes the beginning went through between preview and publication. For example, the seethe went from an apparently triggered mechanism to a natural occurrence. Anyway, Charlie and Tress are adorable, he gets sent away and subsequently captured, Tress's dad is awesome and knows how to work a guest culture, an excellent switcheroo on the docks happens, and Tress gets captured by pirates. And then, captured by pirates. Got very good arms. Speaking of Fezzik, You are the brute squad. I mean, Fort, we've got our first deaf character in the Cosmere. As a professional sign language interpreter, it's this type of representation that I'm really excited to see. And he has a live transcription tablet. I work with those all the time! Except his is better because it's Nulthi and Awaken Predictive Connection circuits, and not speech-to-text software. Although, still has autocorrect issues. Huck is a rodent of unusual cognitive and linguistic ability. I don't think they exist. We've also got official known world hoppers. Hoyd isn't just telling the story, he's in the story, having lost his sense of taste. Sidebar, I was at the store the other day and saw a couple of seemingly otherwise fashionable people who were wearing tube socks and slip-on sandals. Is that back? Because I am concerned. We also have Ulam, who gets name-dropped in The Lost Metal. You have six fingers on your right hand. Ulam might be additionally invested, because he's somehow manipulating connection to communicate. Here we get some more hints as to the possible time period we're in. The Chondra have all been getting weirder ever since Sazed released them. That hasn't happened yet. And also, he's another Chondra that has been off-world for potentially decades at this point. We're in the future. More evidence, apart from the freaking silver rocket ship? We've got laptops, computer monitors, plastic coverings over fluorescent lights, a talking onboard computer, as you wish, Fort's tablet, and all the random modern-y things that Hoyd casually mentions. Uh, tires, candy wrappers, nitroglycerin, experimental film, vending machines, liquid nitrogen, plus three separate mentions of marmosets. You keep using the Hort. Oh, and we need to talk about Raina. She's actually first introduced in Mistborn Secret History as a member of the Irie. So she's an Elantrian, presumably from before the Riode and Fall of Elantris. She's got Aeonic script on her carpet, a map of the planet on her floor, and she utilizes Aeon Door to do all her curses, including the one, again, on Hoyd. Stop saying that! We've known Hoyd has been trying to become an Elantrian since the end of the 10th anniversary Elantris. Well, he finally gets it. And so we get this picture. This freaking picture. Hoyd's Aeon is Edo, protection or safety. Around the edge, Aeon Da, power or energy. Raina's is Aeon Sheo, transform or change, root of the word Sheod. Around the edge of hers is a lot. If someone wants to translate that, that'd be cool. Side note, I'm pretty sure that Raina here is based on Kara Stewart. Also, look who else is wearing socks and sandals. Like, really, is that a thing now? All right, still on World Hoppers, we have to talk about the first canonical appearance of a dragon. Zysis Refliel, who lives at the bottom of the Crimson Sea, which is apparently nowhere near as deep as the Lilting Abyss on Threnody, and is somehow able to grant boons in exchange for selling people into slavery. The pit of despair. These boons are pretty impressive, replicating Fort's tablet, diagnosing and creating corrective lenses for a person he's never met, locating a random guy somewhere on the surface of the planet, and apparently curing terminal diseases. You haven't got your health, you haven't got anything. Also, he's an Awakener at the Tenth Heightening, and the silvery metal of his claws, horns, and ridges of his body are all dragon steel. Yep. That. 
It's deeply important in Brandon's master's thesis, but it might function differently at this point, so I'm not going to talk about it. Xysis is also probably the guy Chris mentions in the Ars Arcanum for Rhythm of War. Foil, who lives at the bottom of an ocean and is trying to master the Aethers. When did Chris write that? And how long has he been there? Alright, other connections. Hoyd's still mad at Kaladin for losing his best flute. He calls himself a Worldbringer. Shout out to a different manifestation of the Midnight Essence on Roshar. Apparently light weaving isn't the only magic that can be done by multiple systems. Apparently the King's Masks take youth potions. Genuinely want to know if those actually exist. Hoyd mentions he was part of a secret plot to kill God. Which one? And what time? Is that when he said, for your own good, with 16 other people? He also uses the phrase, shards within. Hmm. Death is known to have nails in his eyes, as mentioned by Chris in the Lost Metal Ars Arcanum. Speaking of Lost Metal, the sorceress's army is described almost exactly like Trell's army. Living statues, gold skin, red eyes, though we now have confirmation that they are awakened. That's concerning. Raina also pulls off some light weaving of her own, hiding a reptilian with golden eyes and a toothy grin. What? You did not give us enough information there, Brandon. No! Kelsier gets a shout out. A push for every pull, an old adversary of mine always says. Says z, not said d. So he's probably still kicking around at this point. And that's Tress! Yeah, hardly any connections. Liar! 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 Oh, my secret project four video is going to be like an hour long. Absolutely incredible work, Team Dragonsteel. And specifically, Howard Lyon, who I have to assume has some concept art locked away of Hoyd with an actual mullet. Also, are we going to ever get official Hoyd brand red sequined briefs? Thank you for watching! And now a passage from Tress of the Emerald Sea. Doug is the naming equivalent to Convergent Evolution. And once it arrives, it stays. Thank you, Doug. Freaking Brandon out shouting my shoutouts. If you'd like to be a Doug, support me on Patreon. This is a huge year and I've got big plans for content. I'm going to be posting something almost every week. If you want to see any and all of it early, I'd really appreciate your support. Unboxing of the Tress hardcover will happen as soon as I get it. Because there's always more to read and find out. Never go in against a nerd when obscure plot details are on the line! <laughs>